The Netflix Marvel Universe is over, and we've all been punished. Oh, but make way for the new, make way for the wild, make way for the weird. We are going to talk about Umbrella Academy and Doom Patrol, both of which premiered this week. How? How that's is actually, that possible? That's a beautiful dichotomy of like how strange things just suddenly were in one week. We've evolved from the more mainstream to the insane in one snap, as it, it were. I Absolutely. Welcome back to Collider Heroes. It is episode 293. I am Amy Dallin. I'm Corey John Rowe. And we are once again joined by our friend, Jay Washington. You see how I'm looking at both of you? <laughs> <laughs> what? It is weird. It's a snap. I say, really, Coy? I'm saying, you know, oh, yeah. my brain, I was like, really, Coy? Excuse me for making nerd references. We are corny and we are terrible people. But I love you both. I'm glad to be back. Geek yeah. jokes on Collider Heroes are not welcome. Then where are they welcome? Where are they? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's always good being back. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Well, there's a lot of stuff that came out. Some news is big. Some news this night and so to be able to talk it and just laugh about certain things and just be sad about others which probably isn't the netflix universe for me uh, Ooh, so let's start let's there yeah, dive into that. this week was the official long-awaited other shoe dropping uh after the cancellation of most of the marvel netflix collaboration shows uh in what november when yeah, was roughly. that last fall yeah november uh, december uh, we got the, the, the last two pieces fell down uh, on Monday when they announced that Punisher, which has already completed, and Jessica Jones, which has one season left to go, are both ca uh, canceled I I feel the same at way. Netflix. You choked up about <laughs> it. I, 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 feel, oh. I can't say it out loud. <laughs> it's not real if you don't say, say it. it right. uh, yeah, they're gone. I, they're done. It was inevitable. We knew it was coming, but inevitability doesn't make anything any easier to handle. Like... There are a lot of inevit inevitable. See, I can't deal with it either. Uh, there are so many inevitabilities <laughs> in life. You talk so fast. That word requires you to say it slow. There's too many syllables. <laughs> inevitabilities in life. Uh, but I really struggle with the idea that we won't ever get another new episode of of Charlie Cox as, as Daredevil, of John Bernthal as well, Punisher. We're getting more Jessica but, Jones because they canceled it before it aired. <laughs> but here's the thing: I think we gotta we have to keep an open mind about. We're not getting them on Netflix. The possibility of them going to Hulu because now Disney will be majority or owner of Hulu because mm. they won't put an R-rated content show on Disney Plus. Sure. It's still an option. So that's been much discussed, and I'm glad you brought it up because it, it is something that there's been a lot of like variety reported that they had to wait two years to use the character somewhere else. Mm. There, there's been different... We don't know exactly what the deals right. and the terms are. And my thing is that... Uh, we know that these characters will have a future, and that's what I got out of Jeff Loeb's lovely letter on mm -hmm. Marvel.com where he said, you know, you know Marvel better than that, and that's because there's always, like, Daredevil's not going anywhere right. as a character. I think but I know where you're going. My thing is that, like, it's not easy to put back together a crew, to put back together showrunners, to, like, everyone's moving on to other jobs. Mike Coulter just picked up some yeah. pilot. Like, we don't know. The, the future's so uncertain. Production is so difficult. We don't know that we can just pick up where we left off. So I'm, I'm, that's why I'm doing my morning now. Well, I, I, I agree with that. I, I, I can't disagree with that. It's, it's the, op the opportunity is there. Mm. And the actors who play all of these heroes are still open to come back if the opportunity presents itself. Yes, my culture just took a new pilot, but that doesn't mean in 2020, which is next year. Oh my God. Mm. See every, and that was one of the biggest things I think people forgot when they heard last year about Iron Fist being canceled, Daredevil being canceled and, and Luke Cage. They were like, oh man, they won't get these shows to 2020. We found out the news in November. My concern is the, and I'm rarely cynical, uh, Hulu and Netflix are each other's largest competitor as of now. Yes. Why would Hulu hire Charlie Cox to play Daredevil if that would send the competitors money for the first three seasons to rewatch? Also, it's going to send people to Netflix if you want to know what's going on. They're, if they're starting a season four, why would they be like, here's our competitor show? But and they would by necessity need to make sure it was a starting point for anyone who might just be discovered. But also, you're, you're talking about Hulu who has Runaways that is doing successful. Sure. <laughs> they show reruns of Gifted, of The Gifted, which is successful. So it only would make sense for Hulu to accept more Marvel properties. And now it is it is a win. I get what you're saying about sending people over to Netflix to see the first three seasons, but it's a win now to have it instead of being Marvel, Netflix and Marvels, it's Hulu and Marvel. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, so it's a win-win. It, it is interesting to see what happens with this all the while. You know, but we know for a fact no other Defenders miniseries is coming right. because of how they epically failed the first one. Yeah, as much as you don't want to admit it, it, w it was a fail. I, I hate to say it, you had Sigourney Weaver. I would Weaver, have shown up for more. And you had Sigourney Weaver, who could have been the greatest villain you could have used, 
and you did not utilize them right. What I'm worried about is is kind of to what you were saying. It wasn't <laughs> just the actors that I loved. It was the showrunners. It was the writers. These scripts were oh, written Chael, out Derek for. Oh, a but buddy of mine. Shout out, Chael. What's up, bro? Like these things were written to be. So do you have an inside line? Is he down? Is he coming back? What can Shouts you tell out, us? Shout out, What's happening? Home? <laughs> <laughs> so I heard these were written to be five season arcs. I heard these were mm -hmm. written. They were planned for five seasons. And Luke Cage had storyboards up. Char like Charlie Cox was ready to be Daredevil to the point where they yeah. had scripts written. Two of these shows shows were very far in development in their next season and most of them had five years planned so I can't imagine that another network can wait two years and pick up the slack with the showrunners with the writers with like you know Charlie it Brewster it surprises me if they could even legally use material developed for another network I'm sure they could work it out money solves a number of problems but mm -hmm. like it just sounds really complicated to me and it just it feels like I, I'm doing what you're doing a morning now but much like comic book characters all of these characters have died so they can all come back <laughs> like it's totally an option and if it means we get a new set of Daredevil shows like that's not what I want but I'm there for because I love the character but I really appreciate what Charlie Cox did with the character what Chris Brewster did with stunts what the showrunners did I, I loved those elements and I don't know if we'll ever get that again because they were so bold they were inventive they were creative in ways I didn't know they'd take those chances on this type of show they were darker in ways I didn't expect the shows were all a risk and most of the risks landed I don't know if another network might do that but you have you have outlets that allow you to go to new variations of the property. The Daredevil last season we saw was based on the Born Again arc. Mm -hmm. I know <laughs> what, what I'm saying. Story. People die and come back. They die and come back. <laughs> I, and I understand what some comic fans are like, well, it doesn't really, just you have to look outside the box. Iron Fist needs a reboot no matter what. Because, mm. yeah, they have a five season arc plan, but we saw what happened with season one. Last 30 seconds got dope, though. Of season two. Last 30 seconds. I mean, I'm ready for season three because of what the last but, 30 but, seconds but was. That's it, but that's the thing. The bar so Hulu's Daughters of the Dragon coming tomorrow, right? That's what you're saying? I'm that's hoping so. <laughs> because, look, to put Colleen Wing and Misty Knight together, that would be amazing. Again, that could be a new starting point. Mm -hmm. Heroes for Hire would be a very ironic title to use for the newly relocated <laughs> by network shenanigans versions of these characters. It. But think how it works. You have Heroes for Hire where you actually do the hero for hire mm -hmm. and then you have daughters of the dragon yep and you actually have two new starting points so the opportunity is there and yes the biggest issue is will the cast come back i haven't heard of charlie cox doing anything just yet and that's because he has to learn how to be charlie cox in auditions if you haven't heard he's lost on numerous roles since he's been daredevil because he no he doesn't know how to look people in the eye anymore oh He's full he, was Matt talking, he told an anecdote yeah. about this, that, like he got so used to that. I, I feel like he, he's good. He'll figure it out. It'll take a minute, though. <laughs> you, you know the move? If I was Hulu, announce the Moon Knight show. Just do it. Just give us the live action Moon Knight show, and then you can bring back whatever you want. So you'll have our Hulu will make have your to. first show Moon Knight. Make uh, us make all happy. Two, Moon Knight and Blade. Moon Knight and Blade. But well, that, that brings us into the the do dark want side. A, do we want a Blade TV series again or a Blade film? Oh, okay, fair. I think long form but might like, work for Blade. We, did it work when we had sticky fingers as Blade? Never forget that. I, but I feel like that sentence Never right there changes everything. I'm not sure if the <laughs> sticky fingers method is the way to judge a serialized Blade content. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, but it's just that we tried the series route. Mm -hmm. You know, we tried that route and everybody was like, uh, I don't know. It doesn't mean you can't make a good one, especially now that they've like, if you're developing the idea of a supernatural universe to flow out of it, which is what I would do with mm -hmm. it, like get the get the bloodstones in there, like get the yeah. other monster characters. I mean, the ones that don't belong to Sony. <laughs> <laughs> but you because you, cast... you because you really gonna start pulling like hey. But, but you, you cast like I... a long form dramatic actor like a Maharshala Ali, or which I was like always that. saying. You know I mean? like, I've always been should... an advocate for him replacing. If you're gonna if you're gonna have to replace Wesley Snipes and Wesley's the boy, my homie, I worked with him. Check out Chirac the movie on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> quick tea plug. Yeah, but no if, problem with that. But if you have to replace uh, Wesley Snipes, Mahershal Ali is the best choice as far as look, stature, build, and delivery. Mm -hmm. We saw what he did as Cottonmouth. Mm. And that was, everybody was upset he was killed off episode seven. There is so much they can do. Yes, Moon Knight should be the best thing because everybody's been talking, give us Moon Knight. And it has to be either a series or a movie that goes just straight to Hulu. But that would appease everybody. Hulu would have the winning ticket, you know? Yeah, because Disney Hulu. Plus ain't touching that. They're like, we can't put this cuss in it. And, and Hulu's four uh, animated series announcements is already a good nerd faith. Like, we're already invested. We're already like, yes. oh, I'm listening. And you clearly care about the weird deep cut and those stuff. Are and, yeah, 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 yeah. and those are R-rated. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So Hulu's branding themselves very intentionally as the more adult-oriented. So because of that, I could see these shows eventually landing there. But I think a lot of lawyering is a problem. I think all of the connecting tissue, all of the pieces of the Netflix shows, those might not come together. So it might be easier to restart, and I personally want Charlie Cox back. And I will say, as we're discussing this, just a, a, a piece of 
uh, advice for those listening to the show. Do try to keep track of what we really know and what we really don't know. Yes, we, we've all been running back and forth and doing other things. I had a nice exchange with someone on Twitter who was like, this is happening because Disney bought Marvel. And I was like, well, Disney bought Marvel in 2009. So that was five years before the Netflix deal. Mm -hmm. This is almost certainly happening because of business stuff we can't see. But like, just make sure you've got your kind of facts in order as you're running around here. Because there was recently a thing that came out about Netflix explaining the cancellations. Mm -hmm. So it's like, wait, the blame shifting, supposedly. Yeah, and we yeah. can't really know what the exactly. combination of factors is there. As many people have pointed out, we don't really know how the later seasons did. There have been some mixed critical reactions. Koi and I are on board for life. But, uh, <laughs> 12 um, seasons in a movie. I'm not going to lie, Netflix I'm on board. wants to own their own stuff, and that makes sense. Yeah. And I want to say, uh, ending the cynical side, we did get three incredible seasons of Daredevil, two incredible seasons of Punisher, Two seasons of Iron Fist, uh, and we have a third season of Jessica Jones oh, coming. Hold on, out. you're not gonna talk about that second season of Luke Cage. I'm gonna I was shouts I was, out to I Mustafa looping, Shakira's Bushmaster. I was looping back <laughs> to say, and we got. I'm gonna I'm gonna close out with Luke Cage being a very interesting end to a series because the last button of Luke Cage left me more curious for a season three than anything else could have. Mm. So that's a really interesting thing to leave a show on. So I hope that comes back the most because at least Daredevil had closure. I love the beat of them all. Spoiler alert from last year, sitting around. And, and the, the law firm came back yeah. together. It felt like a, a moment of closure. It did. Whereas Luke Cage ended with like, what up? Everything's changed. I'm like, but don't leave now. They're like, wait, he he, he run he, and, he a kingpin. I, <laughs> yeah, like, what are you doing, bad guy? I do have to also throw out just, just a word for like, surprise or no surprise. Uh, I, those of y'all who follow me on Twitter have already heard this, but uh, Jessica Jones was a huge deal. Watching the world wake up to this character, who I believed for years was unfortunately always going to be a cool secret I had with literally anyone I could <laughs> shove the books into the hands of. Like, just we, we were out there one by one being like, you're going to love this book. Try Alias. You don't even like comics, but you're going <laughs> to. Like, and it worked because that book was so special, because she was so special. Because the story that Bendis and David mm. Mack and Michael Gatos, the, like, the co-creators are Bendis and Gatos, uh, but David Mack did distinctive covers and contributed... Anyway, uh, the story that they created was so special. That character was so special. Her place in the Marvel Universe was so unique and so much fun. Uh, it was so dear to me for so long, and I 0% thought that would ever get adapted and put across to a like mass audience. Just nothing. Um, like, and the first season, I remember we were doing this show, I think, when that first season came out, uh, and Supergirl was on at the same time, and I was like, we are living in some thing that I made up in my head in 1998, not that I knew what Alias was then, because it hadn't been written, um, but like the idea that we could have two different shows with women leads that were so different from each other, mm -hmm. whose tones were so different, telling stories centered around them. I like, I will always be so grateful that they made that. Like the first season especially of Alias, the way they brought her to life, the way they found a spin on that story that let there be darkness um, while avoiding a lot of the pitfalls that I would have been most afraid of with handling that material. Like I, it made me trust in a way that I didn't think uh, TV could earn. Mm. Um, I, I'm in infinitely grateful to Melissa Rosenberg, the showrunner, for the way that she approached and handled that material, for the way they like knocked so much of it out of the park. Obviously, we got out of Marvel Netflix, we got Kingpin and Kilgrave. Um, which and is yes. a hell of a legacy. Um, and we will never look at a hallway the same way again. <laughs> I'd like to literally thank Netflix for every single hallway every, that I judge now. Every hallway fight we've ever seen in any subsequent comic book based TV show, we have always based it on the scene, season one, excuse me, episode of Daredevil yeah. with the first fight with the one yep. shot. And I mean, like, thank you, East and Southeast Asia, for showing everyone how to do that. Yes. Yeah, oh, absolutely, but, uh, absolutely. But, well, thank you, season one, Daredevil, for setting that. Yeah, so, so it, there's a lot to miss. And, and by all means, revisit. If we're not getting any more, those live forever, and they're amazing. And it's it's a beautiful thing they existed in the first place because there's so much better than a lot of things could have been. Also, if I can say this, please go on Twitter, social media, and thank the showrunners. Yes. yes. Thank the showrunners for this because without their visions, we would not have had them. Everyone except for Scott Buck, listen, because season one, <laughs> just don't. But don't send hate because don't send hate. Don't send hate. Don't send hate, but just don't thank them. Do thank Raven Metzner for, for the season, second season for the second of Iron season, Fist yeah. because they upped their game from season one to season two in a way I didn't think possible. Yeah, all season two they, Iron Fist. Because like, like you just said, they brought something to life we didn't expect, and especially with Jessica Jones, because I remember when it was coming out, I was like, ooh, 
<laughs> this is going to be a, a reach because not a lot of people knew the character. I remember. <laughs> you know, and that was my only issue. Yeah. It was one of those not, but again, remember, Iron Man was a character nobody cared about back in the day. Right. Let's just be honest. Now, now. should we talk about positive Netflix? Because yes. there's some positive Netflix <laughs> happening positive. in the world. Now, positively insane is how I'd describe the Umbrella Academy in all the best ways. Umbrella Academy is <laughs> so unique, special, weird, delightful, unlike any tone I've ever experienced. Pogo is real. Pogo is life. I didn't know Pogo could look like that. I didn't know a show could have that kind of budget to make that work. I didn't know I would believe this group of six slash seven, depending on the episode, people as a family, but also I believe all of their arcs separately, all of their arcs together, all of their powers work for me, the world works for me. I love that there's weird little details like landlines exist, but there's all this crazy sci-fi stuff. Like there's so many weird pieces of minutia that build the world so elegantly and fluidly. Umbrella Academy is one of the moments in comic book culture where I think I, I am surprised like I was in 08 with Iron Man. I'm not, I'm not comparing the experience, I'm comparing the surprise. I couldn't believe that show existed, and it gives me so much faith in indie comics. It gives me so much faith in what society is willing to digest that I didn't think you'd ever like. Robert Sheehan is one of my new faves. I'm gonna watch everything that man does. Holy crap, number four. I love this show, and Klaus is my spirit animal. <laughs> Uh, so I am I am delighted. I have begun Umbrella Academy. Uh, I I might have to savor this one because I really don't want to get through it too quickly. Uh, but y'all know Umbrella Academy is my shit. Uh, I love that. Like I reread Volume One uh, to, before watching the show, and sometimes that can backfire because when you refamiliarize yourself with the source material, then you like you notice everything that's different. And in this case, it just made me be like, they're nailing this. Like, <laughs> they are nailing and improving upon the like what was originally. It's because um, there's not that much material for Umbrella Academy, mm -hmm. which is one of the things I was really curious to see how they would adapt. There have been two miniseries. Um, they are by Gerard Way and Gabriel Ba. Gabriel Ba is one of my all-time favorite artists. Uh, he and his twin brother, Fabio Moon, everything they do is incredible. Uh, Gerard Way, of course, is a rock star. Yep, literally. Uh, who turns out real good at comics. <laughs> um, and uh, this was a Dark Horse miniseries. So this is interesting. Like, if you're, if you're tracking the sort of publisher game and where the indies come from, this was a, the, the two Dark Horse series. The third one is going on right now. Uh, and it was notable in part for just being like weird as hell, but very fun. Yeah. Um, and I, I was worried because when they announced they were not adapting this, I was like, "There's, you, you can't. You can't. <laughs> like, no one's gonna go all the way with this. Like, you know, we we tried it with Scott Pilgrim, and I love it dearly, but people didn't show up. Um, <laughs> like, it. I uh, so. In some ways, they have made compromises. Um, there's some stuff that's like full out visually in the comics that doesn't come through in the thing. But to me, those didn't cut against like clearly the spirit is there. Mm -hmm. Clearly the intent to do service to the weirdness is there. Uh, and the core of it, the actual emotional core of like the, the beautiful structure of the, the thing that brings all of these kids together again at the beginning, like it's just, it's perfect. Like the loneliness, the bonds, the frustration, like I, yeah. Y'all know I get a bit squeamish, so there's some violence I prefer to see on the page than on the screen, but like it's in it, it's in the material. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I haven't dig seen the it yet. Out of it. I haven't seen it yet. I know everybody, I didn't know what it was gonna be. I was like, okay, Netflix is another series to see. Then all of a sudden, everybody I follow on Twitter <laughs> is like, yo, Umbrella Academy, Umbrella. And I'm like, man, could y'all not do this right now? <laughs> like, because I, I think I was doing a whole bunch of other stuff. And I'm like, I can't go. But I want to. I definitely want to. Like I said, the emotion. Corey, how dare you? Just, not, you yeah. so, oh, so unprofessional. Yeah. So damn unprofessional. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> it's me texting Corey Bell and Bell and Bell Academy. It's your timeline right. right now being like, what, Jay, you haven't seen it? <laughs> I, I have it, and I, I plan on it, though. I, You know, there are certain things I will go off of people's reactions to. Like, I, somebody says, oh, you shouldn't watch this. I will watch it just to see if it was that bad. <laughs> you know, because some people will say stuff and exaggerate it, and it's not that bad. Or some people will exaggerate something and say it's great, and, and then it's you're not. underwhelmed. And you're like, this is okay. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Well, be I mean, the internet is, in my opinion, authentically excited about this show. That's what, and, and that's and, what I was about to say. They are authentically as excited. And what I like about it is, I the graphic novel can tell you a lot, but there is there is something to celebrate in the medium of acting that you can't always accomplish with just art on paper. And I, I comic books are my life, so I'm not disrespecting the medium. But it's beautiful to see something that translated really well this way translate differently this way. Like mm-hmm. there's a moment in episode four or five, I don't remember which, where Klaus is back from opening I'm not going to spoil anything he's back from opening a suitcase and (laughs) there is more story delivered in the four minutes when he's back from opening a suitcase that tells a lifetime of experience in him acting without a single line of dialogue. I love the fact and it's beautiful. Why you just said that there are literally people watching this video going, "Don't you fucking yeah, yeah, do it! You don't you do it!" I stayed vague, but you guys have no idea what I'm talking about. But people that have seen it know what I'm talking about. But it's really beautiful that with the medium translated with incredible actors, you can tell a different story that yes. you already are aware of. So even and, reading and it like, and then watching it, you have a different experience. Instantly, like casting home run for sure. Oh, man. The changes they made to the characters, I love. Mm-hmm. Like the the way that they've grown it out because clearly like to get 10 episodes out of a, of a TV show out of it they need to add some elements that yeah. weren't there in the original and it's working for me like it's it's very self-consciously artsy but it works because it's like these are weird kids who led a weird life and that's how that's what brought them to this yeah. point in their strange adult lives um, and so yeah uh, two thumbs up fully on board okay. for Umbrella Academy uh, and man Y'all who know that I'm a musicals nerd, we will talk about certain musical cues. I also, I need to, and next week we'll probably do more spoilery, like we'll dive a little bit into this as as this progresses, but I want to say that uh, the kid's name is Aiden Gallagher, he plays a 13-year-old, 60-year-old, and I won't get into why, but that's all, (laughs) it's in the trailer, it's in the trailer, (laughs) but... But, Jay, but, I'm gonna need you to live, live tweet this. Put yes. like a spoiler hashtag on there. I but will. Just be yeah, like, and then what happens? <laughs> it's in the opening episode, but I'm just gonna say I've never uh, not. Se- I think the room. And uh, Beasts of No Nation, have I seen a child actor deliver such a grounded, incredible, believable performance of adulthood? In Beasts of No Nation, you see a kid go from a child to a warmonger in two hours. I don't know how they did that. That's magic. And in The Room, Jacob Tremblay not getting an Oscar nom. <clears throat> but this performance <laughs> is something so special, so important, and I love this kid. I'm going to watch everything he does, and I think he'd be an awesome Robin. It might be because of the mask. It might be because of everything else, but I totally see him as that I have to grow up instantly and be this character, and Boss Logic did a Robin man up, so like the same idea, and it looks perfect, and the, uh, the Robert Sheehan guy I keep talking about, the dude should either be, if they adapt it appropriately, Speedball, because <laughs> Speedball turns into penance, and the the light versus dark of this actor or young joker if they if they do the joker and they start out with, with that hey man, world, we already did. there's only seven jokers right now let's go eight let's get an eighth joker going eight. there's not enough jokers but i i love okay. this kid and i think this he's made for the comic world of uh, with depth and i just the show's so good this guys. whole cast i could do an steal hour this whole of this. cast steal the cast of deadly class just get the next generation of superheroes uh, out of these two incredibly cast shows make the huh? x-men this please so speaking of the x-men uh and this <laughs> technically this is the the thing that inspired them all to a certain extent. There's, okay, separate debates about early 60s comics (laughs) and whether Stanley was ripping off Arnold Drake aside. Doom Patrol. Doom Patrol. Freaking Doom Patrol. Okay. <laughs> came to DC Universe. First episode is out. Some press people have seen more than that. Damn but the first right. episode is out for everybody. <laughs> you want to lead this one, Jay? What so here's so if you saw Titans, of course, they introduced the Doom Patrol in episode four. You got Robot Man, Negative Man, Elastic Girl, Elastic Woman, and Beast Boy. Those are the ones you got. And the chief, who is gonna be a different chief when you see the series. Because <laughs> I was like, wait, Timothy. Yeah. Was we t- all were like, the, the, okay, whatever. What they did, it was weird to me, some of the choices, but I get what they did with this because it, it has to be. It opens up, though, and spoiler alert, but I'm, this ain't even really spoiler. You're going to want to hear this. You get to see Brendan Fraser's ass. Why? Because he's having sex in the first five minutes. <laughs> Caught me out of nowhere. Someone had been like, I didn't expect the sex in Doom Patrol. And I was like, what on earth are you talking and then about? You watched the first, read what, what Doom Patrol have you and in the first well, five? That, that, my, I was honestly shocked by that because I was like, what? It, huh? And it, like, you'll, it'll make sense when you see it. Doom Patrol so adult, I, I would expect them to be like, this is how adult it is, Brendan Fraser butt. Like, to me, that makes but, sense. But it's not even just the butt. It's what else you see go along with it. And you're like, 
oh, you're going to set the tone already that you're going to go above what Titans did. And so they kept doing that. Now, that was my only issue I had with it. Like, they try to be, this, this show is edgy for the sake of being edgy. Sort of how in Titans, how you have Alan Richardson's character as Hawk just being there just to use mf -er all the time. I'm, I'm with you on a lot of these concerns. Because that, that's it, really my biggest concern. I, and to me, my thing is like, you don't necessarily need that because you've got the Doom Patrol. And you, this is like, so this show is clearly doing uh, takes on a couple different versions of the Doom Patrol from history, but one of the most, influ the most influential is the one written by Grant Morrison, mm -hmm. which, not a coincidence, was one of the big inspirations for a certain Gerard Way, yeah. who would go on like 15, 20 years later to create and co-create Umbrella Academy. Like, so there's, but I like I, I don't want to sort of fight with them over I don't know I don't want to fight over those choices where I'm like you can dial I, I, maybe I'll just say you can dial that back and you've still got me and you still got Brendan Fraser just as the voice of Robot He's Man so good. is amazing you know because it's not him in the suit but when you just hear him the way he talks and everything it just flows with the emotion you get mm. so it's it's showing you basically in your mind him being in the booth recording this and you just hear him just being sad and just being what the you know things like that diane guerrero gets my standout award for this mm. her is crazy jane is phenomenal but the one thing they do with her that i don't think they need to do is they show her like a glitch and stuff when she changes personalities mm. just let it be mm. You know, there's small little things I could be nitpicking over personally, but I love the action. I love the hilarity. The hilarity of the show is what makes it. Mm. But also, Alan Tudyk is just like, mm. <gasps> Oh, are we going to fight? I was like, we Alan Tudyk, sir. I Here's my Alan Tudyk issue. Him being the narrator of the show, making the show super meta. Okay. The, the show is self-aware of what it is. Which they maybe didn't need either because they're like, oh, I bet you are so tired of superhero shows. And it's like, it's cool, man. You know, you see what, cool. you see what I'm saying? Those type of things. It's not his fault. He's killing it. <laughs> his delivery he didn't write the he didn't write it. He's just delivered it like a champion. <laughs> and, and I think at the end of the day, people are afraid of the bubble bursting more than it's actually bursting. Because things like Umbrella Cap Academy, you wouldn't ever go like comic show. People that watch that aren't going to associate that with comic Oh, books. yeah, people absolutely. That, and like, making meta reference, like whether or not they've hit the exact level of them, I would choose. Making meta references oh, wait, about this not being two. an ordinary superhero <laughs> comic, <laughs> that's very Doom Patrol. That is very, especially like Grant Morrison okay. on Doom Patrol. Like they... They, they, you, when you read those books, they are like simultaneously a commentary on, because this was the late 80s, they really were breaking away from what other superhero okay. comics were doing. Like, and so they're, they aren't exactly turning to the camera being like, hi, we are the Doom Patrol comic book superheroes. <laughs> but like, Mr. Nobody is very meta about stuff. Okay, okay um, that makes sense for When that. he tells his story in the comics, he literally goes like, do you want to hear my heart-wrenching origin story? Like, that's... Okay, He's, fair. It, that's all from the material. Fair. I wish also Elasta Woman had abilities besides just turning into a blob. Like, Maybe give it time. Yeah, I guess. Because, like, just she just gets upset and gets in her emotions and she just turns into a gelatinous blob. I'm like... But you can see from where we meet her that she's got a journey to go on. Oh yeah, you can definitely like see it. That was you a bold definitely choice see it. where you're like, oh, you have a lot of. You got a to lot go of on. stuff you're dealing with, honey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can see it's, it's building up to something. Uh, Matt Bomer is great. Oh, he's so his, good. And his story, the way they spin it on you, I'm not gonna spoil you guys. The way they spin his story, I'll tell you, Corey, when we stop recording. <laughs> but the way you saw it, Amy, I was like, oh, I didn't expect that turn. It's a different take in some ways than we've seen, and I'm very curious to see where they're going for it, because obviously I've only seen the beginning of that journey. Yeah. But like, well cast, well Very played. well cast. I somehow just pieced together, I, we put these together because it's this rise of amazing indie and odd and weird. Gerard Way's arc on Doom Patrol is my introduction <laughs> to Doom Patrol. And that, obviously, like you said, inspired Umbrella Academy. I just I literally pieced can't together, believe these shows came out the same week. Yeah, I just pieced together that everyone that grew up on Black Parade era My Chemical Romance is now like 10 years <laughs> older and this is TV. I just like, I need to take a minute for every like the emo goth era hot topic kid that grew up with Gerard Way like, now he's running your comics and this you know, is he was amazing. an intern at dc back in the day oh that's so cool like he's deep nerd that's amazing it just turns out also a rock star and yeah like i i still like mcr that's a fantastic that he's this creative in so many different ways and both of these shows launching the same weekend the same
same, I think, turn for weird. Like, I think Guardians of the Galaxy made us aware of the cosmic ability to, to go that direction. I think Wonder Woman showed us so many things about what movies can be. But I think this is going to be when we look back and go, oh, no, no, there's no too weird. Lean in. Comics can be crazy. But you know what's another Put thing we have to give credit to? And I hate to say this for some people because they don't like to admit it. Watchmen. Oh, sure. Watchmen's fantastic. Because Watchmen was different from what we knew. You know, we knew the Batman, Superman, Captain America, Iron Man, all of them. And you see this really dark, gritty take on superheroes mm -hmm. in Watchmen. And you're like, wait, it, it can get that dark? I'm curious what effect that has had on, like, the audience that, that wasn't that was introduced to those ideas by the Watchmen movie. That's like, we, that's something we should definitely return to and ask about if there are folks you, but you get what I'm saying. Trajectory. You get what I'm saying. Yeah. And I also think next month is the boys. This is really going to help the boys. I think this is going to yep. help Amazon's original content. This is going to help original content creators all over. This is going to help. This is going to help streaming services invest more money because if these do well, they know that you can be as weird and the audiences will show up. So and the like boys you said, the bubble is not about to pop anytime so soon. Anytime soon. People keep saying the bubble's going to pop. The bubble's going to pop. It's not about to pop. Yeah. There's so and much for, variation of content. It, it, in part because they are doing the work of expanding out the types of comics they're adapting. Yes. And again, like comics, like books, come in all kinds of genres, come in all kinds of formats, come in all kinds of uh, material. And so now that Netflix is like, oh, we bought all the weird ones. We literally <laughs> bought Miller World. Yeah, we yeah are that was. You, like, like, we are going to see what happens with all of that. It is just, it's a bizarre time because there was a time where, like, the three of us would have been following any one of these shows obsessively because we couldn't believe something like it was made. Mm -hmm. And now they're literally coming out the same week. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? And next month's The Boys, and then the following, and next month's Captain Marvel, and then the following month is Avengers Endgame. And it, it's, it's and Shazam and is next coming, month is it's next ridiculous. Month, yeah. uh, speaking of an overabundance of goodness though we got some minor mutations let's minor mutate so much news <laughs> All right. So we've got Alita Battle Angel, uh, which won, it's a comic book film, thank you, uh, won the weekend, but does have a good way to go to make its money back. So we're watching the international releases to see uh, how that As one always, goes. the international release is what mainly a lot of studios are focusing on now. They don't, they want the domestic audience to go see it, but they know if it's got explosions, it's got a certain graphic look, <laughs> certain CGI, the international audiences are going to eat it up. So we'll dive into the box so we'll office see. figures and those ideas in just a moment. We also have the mega DC property rumor roundup. Forbes did a full rundown of what the blog might be coming. at Forbes, the blog not at Forbes magazine. Thank you. So. Uh, and I want to talk about all the details in that because I was very intrigued by it. Absolutely. Uh, we've got our first early tracking for Captain Marvel. Could it break 100 million? That would be pretty amazing for a character who, let's be honest, a lot of people are going to learn to love. Huh? Aquaman has cracked the top 20 films of all time, He Marker. cannot be stopped. Tw top 20 of all time. Yeah, we'll talk about that. I it's love insane. it. Oh, man. This weekend, we all collectively got obsessed on Twitter with the alternate universe run of Spider-Man from the 70s from Mexico, where Gwen Stacy did not die. There's 45 issues of Spider-Man I haven't read. This changed my <laughs> life. My <laughs> life. Not like, yeah, got to dive into that. Uh, uh, sorry, I got excited. Yeah, I got excited by Spider-Man. We also found out that the Loki movie, a show, has a showrunner, and it's a very, very good one for this material. We'll tell you who that is in just a moment. And the, the spin we think they may be taking on it. Uh, and we got a teaser and a full trailer for Cloak & Dagger Season 2. And it is official. The Eternal starts this summer. We have a production start date, and that is going to change the MCU as we know it. I, I've literally, in all of our minor mutations, never gotten distracted by a story enough to be like, what do I? Spider-Man has extra issues. Okay, we'll start, we'll start there. Let's, let's, <gasps> let's, let's go there. Because I was just told about this like Saturday. <laughs> that was like, yo, did you know that there were like 40 something issues? I was like, I excuse me? Gwen didn't <laughs> die. die. Gwen Stacy never died because they didn't get it in Mexico. Yeah. Because it just stopped getting shipped to Mexico. So the art, they thought it was just like, so oh, the, we'll just keep going. The version of the story I've I've heard because people dug up a lot of this and uh, shout out to anyone who is able to go and tweet us a, a selfie with this artist because he's apparently appearing at Mexico City Comic Con in like a week and a half. Amazing. Yes, he uh, should be. Uh, heck yeah, underappreciated legend uh, because I didn't know you existed and that's a crime. Um, so there was a period where uh, Spider-Man got so popular in Mexico that they upped the production schedule, but they didn't have enough issues. So they started doing additional issues so that they could come out 
Like, they mm -hmm. asked Marvel for permission to do extra issues, essentially. They sent them samples from the artist, Marvel was like, cool, and there were like these extra stories. And somewhere along the way, they were like, so what if Gwen doesn't die? Um, and this, this has been fascinating because I've heard from folks who grew up reading this stuff, which is so cool. Uh, we, we, you know, it's been underappreciated, undercollected. I, it's, there's some conflicting rumors about like what that timeline exactly looks like. Mm -hmm. Like I got really excited when I saw that wedding cover. It should have been a dream sequence, but it's still amazing. The Silver Age ended when Gwen died. Yes. Which means there are 45 issues of Silver Age comics from an era of Spider-Man at his peak that exist in a canon that we all are just discovering. This is like finding a time capsule from an alternate reality. This is like an episode of an Avengers Every cartoon. Every grown nerd, which we are, is right now losing their mind Wait, hearing this. Yes! Because now everybody's like, how can I... Will they reprint them? Can I... I want to see, I need to read. Like, you can't even finish the sentence when you're trying to talk about this because it's surreal to hear. I forgot I was hear. doing a show. I just stopped talking. It's surreal to hear. Could you, you did not think that you would ever wake up and have more issues of 60s Spider-Man to track down. I That's never impossible. in my life, and four years worth, 45 issues, almost four years of comics that I never thought existed are suddenly a part of me, and I, I actually wish I'd taken Spanish instead of French in high school now. Like, oh, you I feel the same way. I retroactively am like, what have I done? What I have I done with my life? <laughs> Peter Parker, I failed you because I didn't take the right language to learn to read these comics that I didn't know existed. What maybe have I they done? Can, maybe they can put them all on Google Translate for everybody. Just and please. Just like, just <laughs> how do we get these, Marvel? That's my please, question. How do I get these how do I in get my life? To this? I need to know. Marvel or Mexico, whoever has them, just let me get six copies. If we will throw <laughs> our money at you, get it together, like, do, do it. We don't care. Kickstart it. Like, uh, and we'll figure it out. Yes. Whatever it's going to cost to find, collate, clean up and republish these issues <laughs> so we can find out what the heck happened in them. My mind. And now some I'm of those covers are like Starango, eat your heart out. Yeah, like I, I now need to change my collecting list because I've got 45 <laughs> issues I don't have. Uh, so you're our guest this week, I Bogart at the top of the show. What is your biggest story of the week? Because I just had to talk Spider-Man. My biggest story of the week has been the fact that Cloak & Dagger season two's trailer is out. Yay! I've been waiting on the second season since its debut season because, first of all, when I heard Cloak and Dagger was dropping originally, I was like, okay, but then it was on Freeform. I was like, oh no. Because you, you just thought it, I thought it was going to be Dawson's Creek with superpowers. Sure, sure. <laughs> and then when I saw the first episode, I was like, this is dark. This is Netflix like. And then I loved the first season. I was like, so when are we getting the second? We never heard anything. Then we saw the picture with uh, the guy from Runaways and Aubrey Joseph together. It was like, are they teasing <laughs> the crossover that we want? And I was like, okay, maybe not. Let me not get my hopes up too high. <laughs> and so then the trailer drops. And I'm like, thank you. Thank you for this. <laughs> because now we have them being more of a tandem working together, not just to find out their origin, to now solve crime in a sense. And to see Detective O'Reilly, who is officially now mayhem, and like I was telling Coy and Amy before the show, Detective Bridget O'Reilly is played by an actress named Emma Lahana, right? And I watched it and I was like, why does she look so familiar? And my brain was just irking and couldn't find the answer. Well, then I did IMDb and my nerdiness exploded because I found out she played Kira Ford in Power Rangers Dino Force. She was the Yellow <laughs> Ranger. She was trying to have a singing career, okay? And I was like, oh my God, I love her more. And I just want to interview all three of them just to talk to, just to, talk to Aubrey, Olivia, and then like, listen, I'm going to go to Emma. How you doing? You know, thanks. <laughs> but it's just so great to have this. This is a great show. And it is proving, again, like we just said earlier, the bubble is not popping. You can take various comic iterations, put them on different platforms, and they work. And keep them in different genres, and different tones, different worlds, different and worlds, totally lands. And they land. And think about it. We have, we have two worlds that are potentially going to interconnect. The free-form world and the Hulu world. Mm -hmm. And they're going to interconnect for whatever, whichever way they do it, and then go back to their own separate universe. Can you imagine if we get something that feels like the Avengers did the first time? I know that's what they want the Defenders to do, but oh, can yeah. you imagine if we get a, like a Runaways, Cloak and Dagger team up, or all of these like shows, once they come to Hulu, even something larger, if we get a street-level team up where they have of a major, of that. a bad guy. Can you that's imagine? A, I think I would, um, you know, I probably wouldn't leave my house. <laughs> um, I probably would gain all the way back I lost because I'd be eating everything, never leaving. 
<laughs> and, and just, I probably cry in happiness. And I want to give Defenders <laughs> credit. It did do something I thought was really bold and impressive, is it had all the music and lighting cues from each of their teams. Mm. That made it feel like a comic, and that was really bold. So I'd love for little things And it gave me right. some of the beautiful moments I wanted of watching people interact with each mm. other that gives you that sense of interconnectivity. A four-fight hallway happened because of the Defenders. The lighting cues were the best thing. I mean, the show had great moments. The lighting cues were best for the nerd in me because when you saw Luke Cage introduced, it went yellow. Mm -hmm. Every scene with Charlie Cox's Daredevil, it was red. Jessica Jones is purple. Uh, Iron Fist is whatever color they decided to use <laughs> that day. Because it's, it's between yellow and green. They have mm -hmm. to figure out which one they want to use. But nonetheless, you saw their individualities until it became a white spectrum when it was together, except when they were in the Chinese diner. If you paid attention, all four lights were there. It, and every time they cut around the table. Yeah. Yeah, every, now, yeah. Cloak and Dagger, I think, would do something similar with season two. It surprised a lot of us. So hopefully they, they can grow this world even like a high, higher budget, higher production value. Mm -hmm. Because I loved what season two did because it made New Orleans part of the character, which I think the Netflix shows do really well as well. But it also it maintained an adult sensibility that I didn't know we'd get from Cloak and Dagger and I actually care more about Cloak and Dagger the TV characters than their comic counterparts Absolutely. and that's so rare is it is it scary though I'm sorry to cut you off is yeah. it scary that they're getting a higher production budget because sometimes that can take away the feel from the show I want to see more Cloak like well, I, I, can get, cloak. I, I can be yeah. with that you get what I'm saying but when you add this bigger production budget we've seen that in many shows where now the show's tone and feel changes because now they, they have better cameras and they have more expensive lighting and things like that and so so now they're trying to add this blockbuster fill on the TV screen, and it takes away what gripped you the first time. I'm, I'm not too worried about that with this one, mm -hmm. because it, there's a difference between, like, this was small and meant to be small, and this is doing its best on the budget, it would, like on, like, a TV budget. Because sometimes in that case, you're like, if your aim was always at a certain sort of enhanced reality tone of being like urban superheroes and you get the budget to help support that a little better that's different from being like oh, yeah. i planned this as a family living room drama but now i have to add explosions because that's what you know that's yes. a change in tone yes I, I think i'm i feel safer with an expansion here because it feels more like they're probably the way we saw with runaways they get to do a little more of what they wanted to do all along oh yeah you like runaway I mean? season two you can you can feel that blood budget flex and it was in all the right directions. and tandy's light daggers just look so amazing mm. they did those flaws it don't even look cheesy it's like oh this could be real yeah <laughs> and, and those are characters like i said that in the comics i didn't identify with so I'm, i really like the show and i'm really excited for do we know two. why it is that sony doesn't own them they were introduced in spider-man they probably didn't they probably, they probably didn't, didn't care to they probably yeah, never they cared probably about just didn't bother listing they them just thought about the essential spider-man characters they wanted like morbius you know, Morbius. Because yeah, remember the Fox Kids show, Morbius was a main dude. Fair. Never and remember. Fair. It's, it's very cinematic. Like that Deadpool joke, like your luck powers aren't cinematic. Morbius is very cinematic. Oh, He's yeah. a vampire. They do well. I'm not, uh, no shade on Morbius. I love him. I'm just saying. What about Jared Little? However, next one. <laughs> but I, I think we should talk about this Disney Plus news with okay. the Loki show. Yes. Because I teased the writer, but I wanted to dive into the writer. Rick and Morty writer is on. <laughs> yes. Now, we think this might mean a series of history of Loki all alternate reality jumping insanity. The uh, alternate reality jumping? I think, no, I no, think not alternate, just regular history. He the shapes, impression I he got. shapes history. That, that's what I mean by alternate reality. Like, we'll see him. I think we might see different alternate versions of Loki. I think we might see girl Loki, teen Loki, all that. Oh. So that's what I mean by alternate reality. Sorry, that's probably not, not the right expression, but alternate Lokis by way of Rick and Morty writer, I think could land because that is the beauty of the character is he's the God of mischief. I love seeing him come back as different manifestations. I'd love if Tom Hiddleston was 70%, but I'd love to see them mix it up since they have this this tone i can see that i it, it makes sense like if you can get tom hiddleston as the spine it, it is it's one of those hilarious things like when you cast a wonderful actor to play a shapeshifter and you're like but i want you to be yourself because <laughs> um, loki the god of mischief has canonically had several incarnations yep. that they can go to but we have tom hiddleston so like whatever balance they find there i i'm gonna follow them on but yeah the article sort of made it sound like we're gonna see the way he's influenced events throughout history and i am always down for some historical fiction shenanigans it sounds great forrest gump with loki that is basically <laughs> what this is when you because oh, beautiful think about it forrest gump loki influenced, starting world war one why yeah, he's the reason certain wars have started he's the reason historical events start it's forrest gump with loki with the writer from rick and morty golden age of superheroes just, guys just, just loki just messing with joan of arc <laughs> like, she kicks his butt to the curb. It's it's gonna be great. You know what? We're she kicked me to the sense. curb. You should you should burn her. You should really burn her. <laughs> oh, sad. But that's what happened to Joan of Arc, Fair. though. <laughs> Accurate. Uh, is there anything else? Like I, 
Captain Marvel tracking numbers, that's exciting news to me. I'm excited that it's tracking high. I, I'm trying, to, like, I'm trying to sort of figure out what realistic expectations are here because obviously they're coming in with MCU clout. They're coming in with an endgame tie and they're coming in with all this stuff. But it is a first time like character movie. Mm -hmm. So we need to be comparing it to other first time character movies. Um, so that hasn't been introduced. She's only been on a pager. She's only, yeah, she hasn't been introduced fully. Like Black Panther had Civil War mm. to fall into. Wonder Woman had Batman v Superman mm. to go into. It, it, this is the one that's going to be really weird because we're looking back at Guardians of the Galaxy days. Yeah. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 days. Yeah. And yeah, everybody's hyped for what she's going to do in Endgame, but like this is, this is the origin. It's not the origin story, but it is the origin story. And it's, we see, we got to, you go, Duh, like, how do you, because it's like, how do you put that into a category in this day and age with Marvel? I do think, I think people are going to show up. I just think, like, don't forget that not everyone is us, buried neck deep in this stuff, already familiar with all of it, watched every trailer. Right. And like, I think word of mouth's going to carry it because all the reviews are coming out amazing. Like, all the Twitter social reviews, the social I media think reviews. that's going to carry it Saturday, Sunday, and then into the second week. I think it's going to have legs because well, of how good it sounds. I was going to say something. comment because I am being very careful. Cheshire well, cat smile. I'm like, I don't know anything what you're talking about. I well, you know, because everybody's getting paid to say it's a good movie. Oh, yeah, Disney, mail my checks. Yeah, mail uh, my checks from Disney. Everybody. No, I do want to briefly, we got to get to comics, but yes. I really, there's a there's a rumor roundup that Forbes blog did. Yes. Now, this has been going around. I found it interesting, but it is a rumor roundup blog, <laughs> and we did hear in this that Margot Robbie is still attached to Suicide Squad 2, which intrigued me. We heard that Superman is going to take the back burner for Supergirl to, to take the forefront, yeah. which, as a Man of Steel and Henry Cavill fan, I have some thoughts on. I love Supergirl, but I think both can exist. Uh, and it also talked about, basically, the shape of this going forward but it's a Forbes blog Jared so Leto. Jared Leto's Joker not being as involved it is done in a sense what do you think about this whole it was like seven different stories I just I want to get out in front of it we don't know the sources for these rumor the, rumor the, rumor the, the all rumored, article yeah. seemed pretty responsibly written in terms of like it didn't seem super clickbaity it seemed like someone just trying to do their best like some of this stuff it seemed like was just playing on things we already got in other episodes like or in other press releases um, and news articles like when they talked about maybe working on a Supergirl movie the sort of implication was we do we are not currently working on a Superman. So mm -hmm. repeating the they've backburnered it for that could be new information or could just be a recap of that stuff we've already talked about. Sorry, I want to let no, you. No, you, you know you got like, you got a great point with that. The you have heard a lot of things, but a lot of these in in the blog as well because I read it. It cited Warner Brothers. It cited Warner Brothers as said, especially when it comes to the Jared Leto Joker. Because now they've pulled his solo movie. They're not going to do that. They're not doing the Harley Joker film. And so it's like, is this the officially the end of the Grand Theft Auto Joker? <laughs> you know, now it makes room for Robert Sheen's Joker. Now we only got two. I'm okay with it. See, we're See, you, back you, full circle. But I, yeah, yeah. It, it, to, some of that seems sort of natural, like they not currently moving forward on those things because we have Birds of Prey going on. Like, does seem like a confirmation of sort of the mm -hmm. direction that we're hearing. Part of it that really intrigued me, uh, but I don't know quite how to interpret, was that. He was debunking a rumor that I hadn't even heard that like there would be a continuous Barbara Gordon storyline between. Yeah, I, heard that. I hadn't I, heard that. I hadn't heard it, so it didn't need debunking for me. And he said it, they in fact aren't linked. And what I meant, I don't. What I'm not sure how to interpret there is like. Does he mean these movies don't take place in the same universe, or does he mean there is not a continuous Barbara Gordon story, which we already kind of knew because we would have heard by now if Barbara Gordon was in Birds of Prey? Because they, so. they keep mentioning that. That's one thing they keep making sure to mention. Bad Girl is not in Birds of Prey. Bad Girl is not in Birds of Prey. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I think we get it. Because it was supposed to, remember, Joss Whedon was originally attached to the project. He's no longer with To this, Bad Girl. Yeah, to Bad Girl. Yeah. And now that's still. A, a possibility of not Whedon, but the project happening. No, they've got a, like a, they got the writers, and they don't. It's the same writer from Birds of Prey, which is why I'm like, okay, she's probably got a plan for Gotham. Mm -hmm. We okay. don't. I don't know whether to interpret this guy's thing as being like, okay, never mind, there is no plan for Gotham that connects those, or whether it's just like, no, that thing some people might have heard about Barbara Gordon is not the case. That's so, that's my like grain of salt for this. We rarely talk on rumors. I just thought people, you should check out the the blog. You should check out this four blog article because it is a dense amount of information and we've been playing catch up with DC it seems like for the last couple years of what's happening what isn't so I this is basically my call to Henry Cavill Man of Steel 2 every time 
there's eight million things. <laughs> I want that to happen. So I think that there's hope. I don't know. Once again, these are all rumors, but we do have some comics to talk about, so we should die. And congrats to Aquaman. Heck yeah, Aquaman. <laughs> 20. 20. Oh, Paul. I'm just proud. <laughs> we get to make so many more water-based puns for years, and we're all thrilled about it in advance. It didn't sink. We have a comic book pull list this week at the top of it for reasons uh, I will explain in one moment. Bitterroot number four. We also have Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man number three. Uh, a debut. I'm taking a chance on. Really excited for this new Vertigo book. High level number one. Naomi number two because I love number one. And a trade paperback you should get on this week. If you'd been hearing us very rave about it and been putting it off, you need West Coast Avengers volume one. Bro doc. Okay, so Ed Asner, mm -hmm. comic book fan. Mm-hmm. Tweeted out a picture of himself being like, can't wait to jump into Bitterroot, which is the supernatural family Harlem Renaissance monster fighting image comic <laughs> that Ed Asner cannot wait to read. This is a beautiful world. He even tagged <laughs> Sanford Green, the artist in it. That's David amazing. Walker and Sanford Green have this book, and like, I just, I love the, I love the future. Well, you <laughs> forget, we, we, we're finding out who are more and more comic book hero fan, comic book hero fans, comic book fans, hero fans. There are fans, heroes so. because they're comic. Yeah, fans. but they're fans, and you like wait. What? Because now it's op it's cool to be open about your nerddom and your mm -hmm. fandom. You don't have to be like, yeah, let me go and get three of these issues. Put them, in <laughs> Put them in a brown bag. They are in the go. same brown bag as the liquor store in Poland. You know what I'm saying? Just you saying. don't have they, to they do that anymore. Bags, yeah. So to see Ed Asner is that, it's like, okay, cool. <laughs> I I'm with that. Now, who else? Let me find out that, like, you know, a big, like, George Clooney is out here just reading old school Spider-Man comics. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I want Barack Obama picking up some Spidey. I want to know. Oh, you know Barack Obama guy. I'll tell you. <laughs> he no. was in one, so you know yeah, he's Yeah, oh, they put no, him exactly. in the comic, okay? He had five variations of the cover. I own them all. Believe me, it was a very I, expensive month for me. But I remember that. <laughs> speaking of Spider-Man, Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man number three. If you haven't picked up Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man yet, Tom Taylor is one of my favorite writers working. He gets these characters. He gets team. He gets world building. He gets comedy. He gets respecting a universe, but also building on it. And that is exactly what we need a new take on Spider-Man. Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man is so neighborhood-based, you meet Peter Parker's literal neighbors. It is <laughs> so contained. It is so Silver Age feeling. I love that right now, Peter Parker's Spider-Man just ended. I love that run because it felt contained. This feels even more contained. I love cosmic world building, globe trotting, insane comics, but I also love when it feels like Spider-Man could just swing over my head, and this book <laughs> is a book that's a love letter to Spider-Man just swinging over your head. Thank you, Tom Taylor. Pick up all three of these issues. It's one of my favorite Spidey runs so far in years. So, if you are in the mood for a big, high-concept sci-fi shenanigans, um, I, I'm, I'm putting this on the list just because it looks really cool, because I'm interested in the new Vertigo stuff. The preview art I've seen for it is fabulous. High Level is coming out from Vertigo, um, and it's just, it's some kind of future story of, like, it's, it's got actually a lot of common DNA with Alita, which is probably not a coincidence. <laughs> That's a really influential work. Um, it, but it's like dystopian cyberpunk future gotta go on the run with a secret mission to a place that may or may not exist like it, it looks like a lot of fun and the art is absolutely gorgeous so take a chance on a new thing this wednesday and naomi number two is out this week now naomi number one i really liked it's bendis who you guys know i like but it is a book that is superman adjacent so <laughs> it's a world in Superman's metropolis, but you're following a character that is right next to Superman that doesn't relate to Superman. So it feels kind of like, um, do you remember those, those uh, Marvel masterpieces uh, where it was like Ben Yurick's story where like Alex Ross did the cover? What were those oh, called? Oh, they're re-releasing them right now. By the way, thank you for that shout out. Marvel's Annotated uh, didn't make my top five the other week, but it just started coming out. It's the re-release of the series Marvel's. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Kirk Busiek and Alex Ross. Yeah. Uh, uh, like they're adding annotations and doing new editions and they'll collect it all and it'll be beautiful. It's going on right now. They're beautiful Alex Ross art where it feels like you're living in the world, but it's from the point of view of the newspaper. So you're dealing with the small looking up, and this reminds me of that, but it's a character that's like, what's this Superman situation? So she's chasing it, and she might have power. She's got a crazy history. It's got all the mystery of a fun comic, and it takes place in the world of Superman. So I'm really digging this book. Heck yeah. Uh, our final pick of the week is, you've heard us talk about it, this is your chance, get on board. West Coast Avengers is bonkers and fun. Uh, Kelly Thompson is great. Uh, Stephen Caselli, I think, is the artist. Right I need to yes. check my facts yes. there. Um, uh, it's it just like a really fun, unexpected team in the proud tradition of the loved but never particularly <laughs> a hit West Coast Avengers. I love that they did this. I love that they're like, yeah, we're doing it. New run. And it feels like the West Coast. This feels like Venice. If you live in California, this is 
your book. I love that this book isn't like It might New be York local to us. Here. We're like, <laughs> There's yeah, a bias. Totally. They talk about the 405 <laughs> all the time. So I love that. And they also introduced Brodock, which is a fun, ridiculous <laughs> character. Also Kate Bishop and, uh, I, you know, I just forgot regular Hawkeye's name. Clint Barton, their dynamic is amazing. <laughs> I, that's how much I love Kate Bishop. I forgot about Clint Barton. So <laughs> it's a really strong book and it's a great team book. So I think you should definitely check it out. Do you have a favorite on this list? I'm, I'm with West Coast Avengers, and I'm looking at it only because I want to see America Chavez. Yeah! Because I, I'm hoping that if she can get more popular and get more recognition throughout the comic books and whatnot, it'll get the word out to possibly adapt her to a TV series. Mm-hmm. You know, like, this character deserves to be out there, so let, let's do this. And then you get Gwenpool. Gwenpool and Quentin Quire have a romance. You're not ready for it. And Danny Fernandez should play America Chavez, just saying. I'm, I'm all for Danny playing. I'm just, like, I just, that's I'm, how I we see We already her. have, um, oh, my God, I'm going up on her name. Uh, Beatrice from uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> well, who's the actress who plays uh, Rosa on Brooklyn Nine-Nine? Tweet us, internet. Tell us about it when this airs. Well, I follow her on Twitter. I know her name. Now, uh, we have a sweaty question of the week while we look up that actress's name. Now, Twitter questions, you guys have been incredible about asking. Stephanie Beatrice. You've been asking incredible questions. We love your questions. Please keep sending them. Our sweaty question of the week comes from Preston B at Brian T. Chirper. I'm not sure which one is your name, Brian or Preston, but I like both your names. <laughs> what genre of comics is largely untapped when transferring to mediums like television and movies? I love this question. It's a good question. This is a great question. I will say the most neglected right now is probably the slice of life indies. We've Ooh. had a couple. We've had like Ghost World. We've mm -hmm. had stuff like that, but we're still waiting on Strangers in Paradise, which I guess is also crime fiction. But, you know, like, oh, no, it's crime. It's the crime stories. Oh, I changed my answer. They're both good. Do both of them. <laughs> Brubaker's Criminal stuff still hasn't made it. Strangers in Paradise still hasn't made it. Oh, I love Br Brubaker's uh, Criminal. So good. They're, so slice of life and crime. Twin answer. Haha. <laughs> I took two. I, I agree. The crime drama ones. Like, because when you see it, you wouldn't think it's a comic book. And so we are, so, we are so focused now on the powers, the abilities, and a, just a good crime drama that's adapted into the perfect way. Mm -hmm. Let's get more of those out here. Mm. Let's get more. I'm sitting here like this watching the movie. Hmm. What's going to happen next? <laughs> so I'm going to say crime noir because I want to see 100 Bullets more than you believe. And mm. Criminal by Brubaker is always incredible. But since they've both taken those, I'm going to go with uh, Supernatural Horror. And I think that's about to change. I think after oh, Swamp yeah. Thing comes out, I think we're about to see this shift. I think Doc Doctor Strange was like the mainstream version of it. So it at least opened people's eyes to it. But I think horror Supernatural, if you do Blade right, Man Thing right, Swamp Thing right, uh, Moon Knight right. Oh, somebody uh, optioned Bitter Root. Yeah. So like. Friggin' Harlem Renaissance monster fighting. I think it's coming. But right now, I think it's the most untapped next to criminal in that noir element. Yeah. Koi is out here advocating heavily for Moon Knight, and guess what? <laughs> I'm on the train with him. Please make a Moon Knight movie or a Moon Knight TV show. I think long form. I think TV show. Yeah, give it, give it a ten episode season. Mm -hmm. Keep us waiting just enough to keep it going, and just. I want, well, I want to change my answer again because dark and supernatural. <laughs> like they haven't done Sandman. Yet. Right. It's just sitting Joseph there. Joseph Gordon-Levitt made an entire show bible for Sandman. He wrote an entire series order, like was ready, and then it fell apart when the Vertigo merger happened. And like that show could be a mate. Joe Gordon-Levitt as as yes, please. So I think that like more ethereal. It's funny. I think the more regular life and the more ethereal are the two ends. We've got the very superhuman covered, but the other sides of comics haven't really been read. <laughs> Do it. Go to work. Get on Make it, Hollywood. It happen. Um, and thank you so much for watching Collider Heroes. So until next week, stay, stay sweaty. sweaty.